anything in this world that flies, we approach it from a scientific perspective. But when it comes to the science of arrows, a lot of people aren't willing, never mind to accept it. A lot of people aren't even willing to take the time to sit down and listen to what is really going on. Are you someone who's looking for a new arrow build or someone who's maybe just curious to find out what the best arrow build could possibly be? Stay tuned as I answer that question for you by the end of this video. What is up guys? Thanks for joining us here on another episode of Wing and Tail Outdoors. On today's episode, I'm going to be sitting down with Chad Sylvester and Cameron Durr of Exodus Outdoor Gear, and we're going to be discussing the scientific aero build. I don't want to give too much away, but the scientific aero build, as the name leads on, is a scientific approach to building the best flying aero that you can. Granted, this was my first interview and the first guest we had on our channel, so naturally, I was just a little nervous. But take a moment, grab something to eat, sit back, and enjoy the conversation we had, and I'll be with you at the end of the interview. I hope you enjoy. Awesome. All right, so um, if you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick, just let everybody know who you are, may not know who you are yet. Chad Sylvester, I am the co-owner, co-founder of Exodus Outdoor Gear. And I'm Cameron Durr, and I guess my title here would be the creative director of Exodus Outdoor Gear. All right, and I'm I'm Chris Romano. Um, I'm the owner and founder of Wing and Tail Outdoors and Wing and Tail Forest Management. Uh, Chad and I have been in conversation a lot over the last couple of months. Um, I'm starting a business up where I'm doing like TSI work type of stuff in the woods. But then I also have this outdoors portion of the business as well, where I'm um, getting into like self-recording and doing all that good stuff and just kind of kind of trying to dive into things because I feel I feel like I want the best things possible. Right. But not for the reason most people want the best things possible. A lot of people want the best things because they want to say I have this or I have that. But my thing is, if I'm going to go out and I'm going to hunt an animal and I'm going to try to stop a heartbeat that I owe it to that animal to have the best functioning equipment possible. So that way, if something ever goes wrong, I have nothing to blame but myself. Um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to watch any of my prior videos, but I had a scenario this past year where um, I hit a deer and didn't get to recover it. And it's the first time that happened to me in my 20 plus years of hunting ever. So I didn't exactly know how to handle that. And I'm trying to make the right steps towards taking care of that. Um, and with that being said, in my opinion, the most important part of the whole system is the arrow. It is, in fact, the thing that is flying. It is, in fact, the thing that may or may not be able to fix some of your own flaws. And it seems like the big debate in the arrow world today is high FOC or not. But I feel like that's really the wrong question to be asking. I feel people need to be asking the better question of how do I build the most efficient arrow? And that is the arrow that could travel as fast as possible without losing accuracy, energy or trajectory. Um, so today, like I said, what I would like to be talk, what I would like to talk about is a scientific arrow known as arrow concept um, that's originally been uh, designed by Dorch. Now, <laughs> I've listened to your guys' podcast. I've talked. I've spent like hours upon hours on the phone with Dorch over ten or fifteen <laughs> different phone calls. I love picking his brain. Um, I am a math teacher. Numbers and science make a lot of sense to me, but when you start talking to him, he sometimes can get so technical. And it's no flaw of his, but I feel like it makes it difficult for some people to really understand what it is he's trying to say. So my overall goal for today is to ask some questions that I've had as a consumer in the past and what other people I've talked to have had and see if maybe we can simplify some of those Dorch type answers to a, to a level that most people can understand if that would work for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think before we get started here, Chris, I think that you, you made two really good or interesting points um leading into this conversation i'm not sure why the heck i got <laughs> flying. Right, I'll take it. <laughs> um 
you know, we have a saying about like controlling, controlling the variables. If there's a variable in the system and it doesn't even necessarily need to be your archery system, it, whether it's your saddle or your climbing sticks, trail cameras, tree stands, whatever it is, if there's a variable there that you can eliminate and stack the odds or responsibility kind of on your shoulders, then by all means, like you owe that to not only yourself, but also the animal. And I think that was a very important uh, point that you made, you know, at the beginning of the conversation is that like, we owe this to the game that we're pursuing. Exactly. Oh, that, that's, that's Hunter back there. Nice. <laughs> um, all right. So two approaches from the perspective of the consumer. Um, like I said, how could you guys go ahead and explain just the basic idea of what arrow concept is like we all know the basic arrow you go to your, your archery shop you tell me you need an arrow they ask you what you're shooting they give you a spine based on the smite spine chart jam a couple inserts into the arrows and move on so how is this arrow different what? from that what's that you want to tackle it sure yeah so at the simplest level arrow concept is a carbon insert for the front end of your arrow shaft, arrow concept 1.0, that is, there is arrow concept 2.0 that does the same thing to the back end of the arrow, but um, that's way more advanced. But so for the Exodus arrow builds, we take a six inch carbon tube, put the metal insert into that, and then the whole, what it ends up being six and a half inches, seven inch insert into the front end of the arrow. And essentially that is going to make a, 32 inch shaft act and behave like a 27 inch shaft. So it takes the effective arrow length, the way the arrow behaves and decreases it by five inches or so. So if you're shooting a, let's say use the number 32 for simplicity on a full length shaft, the arrow is going to behave like a 27 inch shaft. So it recovers quicker and you retain more energy downrange. That's the, simplest version of it and if you need to picture this as um something visual take a fish george likes to use the example of a fish and when you draw a fish draw a goldfish right you have the big circle and then you have the tail the x point of that fish is the node of the arrow gotcha. and the arrow concept elongates that node to where that goldfish now looks like a mackerel or a walleye, a slimmer fish. And that does a lot for just energy retention inside the arrow and forgivability when you shoot it. Okay. Um, and that, that pretty much lines up with the, um, the image I had in my head. I almost think like when you guys were kids, you ever take like a rope or a wire and kind of like spin it around and see how far out you can get that wire. And the smaller the wire, the, the, the less wide that wire was able to go. That's what I picture arrow concept doing for an arrow. Um, similar to the way a washing machine um, being out of balance or a car tire being out of balance um, and just reducing the amount of flex. So reducing the area that that arrow can flex on, like you said, is going to increase uh, or decrease the time that it takes for the arrow to recover. Sure. Um, and my next question was, uh, what gluing the, the tube inside does for you. So you pretty much answered that, uh, that along the way also. Um, now this one, I'll be honest, this next question is kind of a little personal because I ran into this issue with the arrows that I just ordered from you guys. And it was, um, I went with arrow vein three, which I absolutely love. I love the design of them. I love the idea of the spin, but I ran into an issue where I wasn't getting the, distance out of my sight that I was with my prior arrows. And I wasn't quite sure why, but when I talked to Dorge, he told me it was because arrow concept three, or uh, I'm sorry, arrow vein three is meant more for arrows that are 315 feet per second or faster, which mine are not hitting. And it, it leads to the same question for under that magic number that you guys always talk about of 265, 275 or under, right? So if you have someone that isn't reaching those super high speeds or someone who isn't reaching or or is underneath that magic number of the 265, 275, what benefit, if any, does someone like that get? Yeah, I, the number that we always talk about is 275, uh, 275 feet per second down range velocity is where your 
aerodynamic concepts from a f- physics standpoint take effect. And the closer you get to, or the the further you get above that number, the bigger the impact those aerodynamic concepts have. The lower you get, uh, or the further you get um, under 275 p- feet per second, the less all of this stuff matters. So, you know, going away from Aerovane 2 and Aerovane 3 and talking about aero concept, the one added benefit it has, regardless of what aerodynamics um, you're getting based on the velocity of your aero, is the increased structural integrity. And Cameron, you might have to help me out on this, but the, um, not necessarily the flight path, but the compensated angles of impact that you get when shooting at an animal or at a target where um, if you were into a high FOC build, as you, you know, lob those arrows at distance, a lot of times you would impact a target on a down, on a downward angle. Gotcha. Um, with the arrow concept, you are more likely to hit that target perpendicular, which is something that a lot of people frankly don't understand or overlook uh, when it comes to things that have an impact on aero penetration, everybody talks about total arrow weight. They talk about momentum. They talk about velocity and kinetic energy. They talk about broadheads, but angle of impact is something that doesn't get enough credit. Uh, yeah, and, and that that's um that's a great point, Kevin. Did you have, did you have something to say? Yeah, I'm just gonna say to to simplify that. Like, think of cutting a tomato and you take a knife that's sharp, and you cut straight down on that tomato, it takes very little energy to cut all the way through the tomato. If your knife is on an angle, two degrees, three degrees off, it takes more energy to slice all the way through that uh, tomato. So the same thing would be a broadhead to an animal. Perpendicular impact is going to take less energy to um, penetrate than if that angle was even four, five, six degrees off. Right. And coming, coming from a math perspective and you know, the, the shortest distance is always going to be a straight line from point A to point B. And when an arrow is traveling, it is traveling in a direction, which makes it velocity instead of speed. Right. And it's traveling, uh, it's traveling in a straight direction, but angled down, like you're saying. So the arrow wants to go straight, but it's impacting at an angle and it's losing that energy trying to enter the target and kind of give one of these, which is also going to wiggle the back end as it's trying to go through. Yep. Um, so it, what I've noticed is like, uh, Chad, I think you said it, everyone tries to talk about kinetic energy or momentum or, or, or the speed or this or that. And everyone looks at it, in my opinion, as its own standalone statistic, mm-hmm. but it doesn't just stand alone. It's everything kind of combined. Right. So it's like, okay, I could build the fastest arrow possible and be at exactly 4.3 grains per pound or whatever it's going to be. But then what's that going to do to my accuracy or my momentum downrange? Um, so like I said, in the beginning, I I'm really looking for what I can do to get the most speed, the most penetration, the most energy, the most momentum downrange, because like I said, I want, I want the best I can have, you know? Um, yeah. and I, but, so the, um, I kind of answered the, my own question uh, on the next one, but my next question was the fact that these arrows are so expensive to a degree is one of the turnoffs for a lot of people. And they say, well, my arrows cost me 175 to build from nothing to something. They they hit where I want them to go. They kill animals. So I don't really have a reason to change. And I'll be honest, I, I know it shouldn't bother me as much as it does. But like when people say that, it it, it bothers me because I feel like I feel like they're I don't want to say cutting corners. I feel like that's kind of harsh, but I feel like they're cutting corners when when they're go- like I said, they're we're going out and trying to end an animal's life. I think um, the biggest the biggest thing with that is every archer, every bow hunter is kind of they're going through their own journey, their own progression of where they are, right? And are these arrows better than a standard? You know, are the Exodus arrows with Arrow Concept uh, 1.0 are they better than a uh, than, than something you're going to get at your local pro shop? Yes, a thousand percent. But to the new archer who can barely consistently execute his shot he's probably better off spending his resources on his form on his technique learning what he has in a bow versus spending you know 275 or 300 on a dozen arrows um 
you know, he could probably get something at his pro shop that is going to suffice him at that point in his journey. Okay. Now a fo- follow up to that. Now I, I do agree with that. Um, especially where my, my younger niece is just starting to shoot. She's seven years old. We just got her, her first compound bow for her birthday and she's all excited to shoot it. She just can't quite hold it up yet. Right. So the thing is when someone new is starting out, I feel like they're always trying to figure out what they're doing wrong. Right. And on one hand, I see what you're saying, like spend less money on your arrows, spend more money on your form, maybe get some shooting lessons or whatever the case may be. But couldn't the arrow concept also help avoid them thinking they're making mistakes that is really the arrow's fault? Well, I think it's probably not just arrow concept, but having a correctly built arrow because the build process and how the arrows are physically built are they is the are they built off the first dynamic bend or they have to knock to those arrows? Poorly built arrows can lead you to believe you have flaws in your shooting form or in your bow. Um, so like if you have the wrong static spine, you're never going to get those arrows to to tune or fly correctly. Um, if you buy a, you know, just go to your pro shop, get a dozen arrows, and you don't go through the knock tuning process, you're gonna have 12 arrows that all fly a little bit different. So even outside of aero concept, just going through the build process and understanding how to assemble those arrows in a way that you're going to maximize what that product can give you is also a a, a big advantage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Cool. And um, does that aero concept give the shooter a more ready to shoot arrow? Like, is there Uh, less tuning that is involved when you get a arrow concept arrow versus a regular old arrow? Well, yes and no. But So let me clarify one thing on the arrow. Con- I can give you an arrow with arrow concept and I can not spine align that arrow. Okay. And I, you can go ahead and take it and shoot it. And then I can take an arrow concept build arrow that is spine aligned. The spine aligned arrow is going to be the ready to shoot arrow. The not spine aligned arrow is not going to be as ready to shoot will it be more forgiving sure just because it's going to be a less chaotic flight but the real benefit to what we're doing with the scientific arrow builds is the uh to the bow hunter saving them time is the spine alignment so um that eliminates all the time that eliminates a lot of know-how too for a new archer or an archer that's been doing it the same way for his entire life he doesn't have to learn something new Um, For me, for example, I never knock tuned anything. I never knew that was something I had to do. Um, So getting an arrow from us built the way that we build them, the number one benefit is the time saving through the spine alignment, in my opinion. That goes hand in hand with arrow concept, but I could build you an arrow without arrow concept and spine align it and it's still going to be ready to shoot. Okay. And and I... I see the benefit in that for someone like me. Um, Like today I'm up at our family property, but I don't live here. I live two hours away from where our property is. So I only get the weekends to come up here. Some days of the week, I can go to the local range at home and do what I have to do. But typically speaking, I have to choose between, all right, am I going to go shoot my bow today? Or am I going to go to plant my food plots? Or am I going to go do what I have to do? You know, so knowing that I could just take 20 shots a day and just get comfortable and keep my form down and not have to worry about my arrows functioning or my bow functioning and having that time for other stuff is like priceless. It, it, it really is. Because um, when you think about it, 52 weeks in a year, 52 weekends, that's only what, 104 days out of the entire year if it doesn't rain. And this year, it just seems like it only rains on the <laughs> You know, so th- this year has been this year has been a little crazy. Um, so I have one last question for you. I don't want to keep you too too much longer. Um, say I'm a DIYer. I love doing stuff on my own. I'm in the process of trying to make my own climbing sticks, my own my own camera arm. I try to make as much of my own things as possible. If I'm a DIYer, a do you recommend attempting arrow concepts on your own? B how difficult is it? And see where can I get the components for the arrows and the tools or equipment to do it properly. Yeah, I think um, you know a, a one to ten scale, a normal arrow build. If that is a 
five, I would say Aero Concept 1.0 is probably a seven and a half. Okay. As like on a difficulty scale, you can certainly, um, someone who has built arrows in the past can certainly do this build. It's not, even though Dorch is a rocket scientist, it's not rocket science, uh, doing the assembly. Um, but you do have to take some specific protocols on, on the, on the assembly, on the assembly side. Um, on the equipment, like all the components, they are licensed fire knock components. So if someone were was interested in in doing this build, this arrow concept, uh, this arrow concept product, it's applicable in any anyone's shafts. You can put these in an Eastern shaft. You can put them in a Victory shaft. You can put them in a Black Eagle shaft. You can put them in an Exodus shaft. Um, so although they'll go into basically any shaft all the components are available at firenock.com on the website but the build protocol is again it's not the easiest thing to do in the world but it's not it's not impossible it does take a special type of uh adhesive you have to um build those ctis or the carbon inner tubes in a specific way you have to allow them to cure for 24 to 48 hours at, at room temperature with controlled humidity um and then once those fronts are assembled, then you can cut the arrow down to length, find your dynamic band or your your spinal line, and then you fletch based off off of that off of that uh, dynamic bend mark. Okay. One one thing that I would add to the difficulty is the diameter of the arrow. The okay. smaller the diameter of the arrow you're trying to build arrow concept with, the more difficult the build becomes. So, um, for example. Uh, 246 shaft is the Exodus MMT. That arrow concept build is a lot easier to build than the 204 diameter shaft that we have, which is the Exodus NIS. Okay. Um, the 204 or 5 millimeter diameter arrow can be anything from a 201 to a 207. So you're inserting a carbon inner tube that is like, what is it? One, it's 166? 166, yeah. Inside of a 201 one to 207 so you have a lot of play depending on the arrow shaft so right. the arrow concept builds that we're doing for the exodus nis 204 the ctis are designed for that shaft so we have left to less tolerances in that build and it's still more difficult to get that run out or the um tolerances perfect on that arrow so a 166 build is going to be even more challenging. If you are a DIYer and you want to try this yourself, start with a 246 or even a 300 diameter shaft, get the basics of it down, and then there's additional steps that you have to take the smaller the diameter you get. Okay. That um that seems pretty reasonable. Um, now, you guys have mentioned that there's multiple, or any components that you wanted to get for Aero Concept could be found on the Fire Knock website. Now, someone building these arrows once they start do they need to use all of those components from front to back in order to make it uh, effective or, or beneficial like do they have to use fire knock inserts fire knock um veins for example and and the and the knocks and, and inserts and whatnot to get them on the on the front end of the build uh with the carbon inner tube because that is a patented product you do need to use some type of compatible fire knock insert with that CTI. So that whole entire front assembly um, for Aero Concept has to be a fire knock, fire knock product. There's no one else in the world that makes it. Uh, so you're kind of, uh, that's the only choice you got. But when you get to the back end of the shaft, as far as vein configuration, vein type, knock type, you can change that up and, and play with, um, you know, configuration that's going to work based on what broadhead that you're shooting. Because, when you get to that 275 feet per second and you start to have those uh, aerodynamic concepts come into play, the broadhead that you use on the front of that shaft is going to dictate or should dictate what type of vein configuration that you're going to be using. So if you're a guy that shoots, you know, big fixed blades, solid, uh, like an iron wheel, you're not going to probably, you're not going to want to shoot Aerovane 2 or, or Aerovane 3 because of the rate of revolution. Um, you know, there's less drag, there's more lift there. 
Um, so a lot of it just depends on what type of broadhead you're going to shoot. And to add on that, the epoxy on the front end, there's a two-part epoxy from Firenock. That epoxy is 100% essential to adhering the CTI to the inside of the carbon shaft. You can't use any other glue to put the CTI into the shaft. You can use a different type of glue to put the insert into the CTI, but the two-part epoxy is absolutely essential to that build. Okay, and I, and I believe, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that's because it, it flows pretty well and it takes a little longer to dry. So that way, if you have to recenter that inner tube or, or anything like that, it, it gives you the time to be able to do that while also sealing up all the gaps, right? Well, and it's a super slow set epoxy and it never, I don't know if using the term never fully cures is the right way to say that, but there's always some amount of flex in the glue. Okay. So the, um, relationship between the CTI and the carbon shaft, that that was a hard glue inside of that, that glue would crack and you would lose the adhesion from the shaft to the CTI. So that never fully hardens and it allows some flex and give between the, um, the adhesion. Gotcha. And I'm, and I'm assuming that gives, um, a lot of benefit in colder weather when, uh, when yeah. the arrows are nice and cold and the glue is nice and cold and you, know, you hit a shoulder or something. Yeah. The glue, <laughs> the glue is not going to just shatter. Okay. So, um, Chad, you brought something up and, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to end it with this. And, um, if you guys are kind enough to join me again, sometime, anything maybe we can dive in this, this world that further. flies, but, we um, approach it you started getting into a little bit of the scientific side of stuff just a few minutes ago, planes and helicopters. It got me, I, it really doesn't matter. Thinking about this something from. that takes flight has a lot of science behind it. Sorry about that. But when so, it comes uh, to the science, th this is an errors. idea I've kind of been thinking a about a lot of people lot, aren't right? willing and never mind to accept it. A lot of people aren't even willing to take the time to sit down and listen to what is really going on. And that to me just, it just blows my mind because like I said, anything in flight takes science to do so. And it would just, I feel like if people were to take one second and just have an open mind that this, this concept could be more widespread across the country and, and maybe even further. So um, I'm assuming that's the goal that you guys have. Uh, that's part of the goal that I have here trying to um, expand this. Um, and with that being said, is there anything else that you guys would like to mention or any questions you have for me? Um, nothing off, nothing off the top of my head. I'll, I'd like to add that your, I guess your, your closing statement there is that the concept to understand in full detail to really what's going on with your arrow with oscillation and the first dynamic band and all the physics stuff that happens to an arrow in flight is so far over over the head of the majority of bow hunters that I think that they get intimidated by trying to understand or process a lot of this information. And in addition to that, once you, you know, we keep throwing that 275 feet per second, keep throwing that metric out there. The further you get above that, the more flaws are going to be shown in your system. So the more the faster you're shooting, the more easily your, your flaws are shown. And I think that's also, it comes into play. Like people sometimes want the easy, simple way out. And the easiest way of doing that is not necessarily, I don't necessarily want to go down the, uh, the, the ranch fairy wormhole, but when you add a bunch of weight to your arrow and you, and you go from shooting a 350 grain arrow to 450 grain arrow to 550 grain to 650 grain, you start to slow the velocity of that projectile down so much that aerodynamics don't matter anymore and anything will fly. And I think that's part of the big draw to um, that kind of thinking that the, the ultra heavy, heavyweight arrows. Yeah, it's just simple. I, I, I had that happen. I mean, I, I jumped down the, I jumped down the heavy arrow hole. I was shooting an arrow that was uh, over 550 grains. I mean, I was shooting at the time I was shooting at a target that was on top of like a 50 gallon drum and it was, it was going through the steel. It, the arrows were going right through, but the, the, the trajectory was just awful. And 
the arrow, even though, even though it was moving slowly, I had feathers on the back. So that was making the arrow pretty loud. And I just didn't like the way the arrow was behaving. And when I switched back to normal arrows, I was actually shooting worse than I was with the heavy arrows for a little while until I kind of focused on my form and got back into it. Um, you know, so yesterday we hit, or two days ago, I think it was, we hit the R100 here in New Jersey. Um, and it, it was, it was a good time. And I'm, I'm happy with the way the arrows are flying. They, they're flying flat. And uh, anytime someone says they're moving fast enough, they can't follow them. It's a good day for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so again, I want to thank you guys for your time. Uh, I appreciate you so much for, for joining me today. And uh, hopefully we can have you back on uh, wing and tail outdoors sometime. Yeah. Anytime, Chris, thanks for the invite. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yep. You got it. Have a great day. And there you have it, guys. The scientific arrow is an arrow build that reduces the amount of range an arrow can flex. It also allows the arrow to fly more balanced and flatter, transmitting more energy at the impact of the animal or the target. One thing I do want to clear up, somewhere in that video, I did mention that it grinds my gears a little bit when people try to, quote, cut corners when it comes to arrow builds. What I meant by that is, a lot of people are just stuck in one way of thinking and they're so used to doing things one way that they don't really want to change. And to be honest with you, as someone that's pretty not comfortable with change, I understand where they're coming from. But when we're shooting an arrow at an animal and our goal is to harvest that animal, I think that as hunters, we have a duty to at the very least educate ourselves on everything that's out there and make an educated decision on what's best for us to be using. As always, I'd like to just take a quick moment to thank you for joining us on another episode of Wing and Tail Outdoors, where success is always just a commitment away. If you like what you saw today, drop us a like, take a moment to subscribe to our channel, and if you have any other questions about the scientific arrow build, drop me a comment down below, and we'll see if we can answer them for you. Maybe if we get enough questions, we can get Chad and Cameron to join us back on the show sometime soon. Until next time, everybody, have a great day.